In 2022, archaeologists discovered 70,000-year-old remains of burnt food in Iraq. Apparently, this is the oldest surviving remains of cooked food, and it was cooked by Neanderthals. They were the ones who lived in the cave where this prehistoric bread was found. Given that each of us has a little bit of Neanderthal DNA in us, the case of great-great-great-great-great-grandmother S. Pi is the most important. Having already recovered the recipe for this Neanderthal bread, now with the proper recklessness anyone can make it at home, even you and me. Today, we're going to look at how humans got a taste for bread and how it became part of our culture. We'll find out if we should be afraid of gluten, and most importantly, we'll find out what's next for bread. Be careful and cautious in the process. You're bound to work up an appetite. In remote antiquity, bread was a currency, a kind of prehistoric Bitcoin. For example, the inhabitants of the Roman Empire craved bread and spectacle, just like we do when we wait for food delivery and the release of the latest episode on our favorite YouTube channel. Today, bread is the main source of food for millions of people. And tomorrow, we may be eating bread from insects and baking loaves in space. It is impossible to imagine civilization without bread, which, by and large, came into being thanks to baking. On the one hand, what could be simpler than bread? Everyone ate it, and some even cooked it. On the other hand, each nation has its own bread. This is bread, and this is bread, and all this is also bread. However, if you discard all the unnecessary, it turns out that behind such a seemingly limitless variety is hidden a really simple formula. A little flour, a little water, a pinch of salt, more heat, and ready. Flour is the most important ingredient in this formula, and almost everything depends on it. Flour is made from anything, even prunus padus. We still don't know who and how discovered this magic formula and baked the first bread, but we do know that 14,000 years ago, it was already being eaten by the Tufians. They were one of the first peoples to move from a hunter-gatherer lifestyle to farming, and they lived on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea and its environs. Material evidence has been preserved. Crumbs. Don't let the Tufians eat in bed, or you'll have to vacuum afterwards. And in Mesopotamia, there were about 300 varieties of bread. In medieval Europe, bread served not only as a staple food, but also as part of the table setting. It was used as something in between a tray and such an absorbent plate. At the end of the meal, it could be eaten or it could be given to the poor so that the accidentally spilled broth would not go to waste. By the way, the bread soup came to us from the Middle Ages when servants often had to eat bread plates soaked with food after their Lord's dinner. They would add whatever was at hand and instead of a meager chowder, they would get a quite tolerable soup, and it was meat broth too. Why did our ancestors get so fond of bread? Because you can just chew grains and do not worry. The thing is that bread has several advantages over ordinary grains. First, grinding and baking the grain increases its glycemic index, releasing unavailable carbohydrates. And compared to cereal, bread is very convenient to store and transport. This, too, has contributed to its world domination. Perhaps the most revolutionary thing in the history of bread was the discovery of sourdough. And here it was not without my old acquaintances, mushrooms. Just imagine the surprise of the ancient when, perhaps by accident, a piece of dough was left outside and exposed to the wild yeast in the air. Soon the dogs enlarged and filled with tiny air pockets. When barked, this dog produced lighter and more flavorful breed than it had been before and began to resemble the puffy loaves we are accustomed to. Ancient people understood the fermentation process quite well because it was necessary for the production of alcoholic beverages such as beer. The transition from liquid fermentation to dough fermentation changed the rules of the game. Wild but cute yeast from the environment took up residence in the dough and began to absorb the sugar it contained. In the process, they released carbon dioxide, causing the dough to rise. Thus, yeast bread was born. Recently, a game designer was even able to bake a 4,500-year-old yeast bread. You don't have to do anything to avoid the lines. It turned out, he claims, delicious. 
Speaking of fermentation, if the composition of yeast dough and beer is practically the same, why don't we get drunk on bread? Because there is sugar in both, and yeast in the presence of sugar begins to do its favorite business and, like a seasoned moonshiners, produce ethanol. Among fungi, it is believed that turning itself into a small distillery is an evolutionary adaptation. The release of alcohol, harmless to the yeast itself, helps them get rid of competing microorganisms. As a bonus, they make any sweet, moist and warm medium slightly alcoholic, be it future beer or future loaf of black bread. But even if we go too far and over-ferment the bread so that the fermentation process turns our loaf into an alcoholized rum baba, the heat treatment in the oven fixes everything. There, the yeast dies and most of the water and alcohol evaporates. True, not all of the alcohol is vaporized. According to the American Chemical Society, all yeast breads contain up to 2% alcohol. Bread will leave few people indifferent. If you can pass by a bakery that smells divinely of fresh croissants, then you have no heart. An interesting question. Why do we find the smell of baked goods pleasant enough? Perhaps this is where the Maillard reaction comes into play. It's when carbohydrates, perhaps just that caramel smell, make food appealing to us. This is the natural process that we have evolved that helps us partly to recognize if a product is spoiled. And if the odor is pleasant to us, then conversely, it means that this product is probably not spoiled and we can consume it. Bread is actually a wonderful product. First of all, it is the only product that we do not get bored with, because many people can consume bread quite often, and it does not get boring. And that's, you know, a somewhat unique property of it, if I may say so, again, without any magic. The second aspect, of course, bread is a good source of carbohydrates, but also of various water-soluble vitamins. These are B vitamins and also some trace elements, for example, it's magnesium, it's zinc and cobalt. Well, again, everything will depend on the type of flour from which the breed is made. That is, breed is also a source of nutrients that we need and that we can get just from this product. There is a paradox. On the one hand, breed is so important and tasty, but on the other hand, nutritionists strongly recommend to give up bread or at least to reduce the consumption of flour. It's not just about excess weight due to the abuse of baked goods. The problem is much more serious. And to get to the bottom of it, we need to look very deep. Get your electron microscopes ready. First, of course, this is outrageous. And second, after scientists conducted a large review of studies on the health effects of bread, it turns out that the problem is not a specific product, but a lack of balance in the diet. Sure, bread has a very high glycemic index, but if you, for example, give up burgers, which is my personal nightmare, but continue to drink soda by the liter, you will not become healthier and slimmer, alas. Very often we can meet such a recommendation that first of all, if a person wants to reduce body weight, he needs to give up flour. It is not quite true, because there are no products that gain fat or, conversely, lose weight. If we talk about carbohydrate sources in general, the national guidelines of developed countries recommend that more than half of the cereals in our diet should be whole grains. Who would have thought that bread is not just a deliciousness for our breakfasts, but a real multifunctional miracle resource? So let's get to grips with these amazing bread innovations. Biodegradable packaging. What a twist. Bread turns into packaging. Imagine, you go to the store and see packaging made from bread. Not only is it stylish, but it's also environmentally friendly. Less plastic, more joy for nature. And bread packaging, like a real environmental warrior, fights plastic pollution, biofuels. It sounds like science fiction, but it's reality. The bread we eat can be turned into ethanol, a type of biofuel. Imagine cars running on bread fuel. Not only would this reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but it would add a touch of baked goods to our transportation industry. And of course, let's not forget about our four-legged friends. Bread can become a source of nutrition for farm animals. It's like the fodder equivalent of the universal soldier, inexpensive and nutritious. In mankind's millennial love affair with bread, there's a supervillain that's ruining everything. That, of course, is gluten. That said, without gluten, 
the very existence of bread would be impossible. Gluten is a mixture of two proteins, gliadin and glutenin, which is found mainly in wheat, barley, and rye. This magical ingredient gives dough elasticity, allowing it to rise, hold its shape, and achieve the texture we all love so much. Gluten has been a part of our diet for thousands of years, but only recently has it come under scrutiny. Gluten intolerance leads to a bunch of unpleasant symptoms. Abdominal bloating, so I have that. Fatigue, also present. Headaches, present. The diagnosis is overprepared for filming a bread issue. In some cases, it's not just discomfort, but a serious health risk. For example, celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder that can cause damage to the small intestine. The more cases of celiac disease are reported by health professionals, the more worried society becomes about gluten. The disorders that are associated with gluten can be divided into two large groups. I would like to ask all of you not to go to extremes, especially when it comes to food and your diet. Many of us, influenced by the media space, begin to see food as something binary, helpful or harmful, good or bad. But as you rightly point out, the key to healthy eating is moderation and variety. One of my favorite rules is modus in rebus. Everything is good in moderation.